I think it's going to be very exciting uh, for the field of ophthalmology to be involved in artificial intelligence. Uh, I, I truly believe that uh, at this stage, uh, ophthalmology is ready. In fact, we're a little bit late to the field. Uh, uh, first, I have to acknowledge being uh, several potential financial uh, conflicts of interest, being on the board of Novartis and also on Verb Surgical, which is a collaboration between Google and J&J, &J, uh, working for Alphabet and uh, have NIH funding at the University of uh, Illinois. So if you look at medicine in general and look where is AI now uh, uh, applicable, uh, you can see this big blue circle in front of you is diagnostic imaging. And clearly that's the uh, uh, lowest hanging fruit. Uh, and uh, if you go back and identify where's the field that's advancing most, it's in diabetic retinopathy. Uh, many of you uh, know a lot about artificial intelligence, uh, but here are some pieces of evidence suggest that uh, AI can help in ophthalmology. It's, uh, um, can be used to identify which patient should be referred to an ophthalmologist for evaluation. For example, if you have uh, machines in GP offices, or they can help ophthalmologists do better diagnosis. Uh, they're never gonna replace the ophthalmologist. It's a partnership between uh, the machine and the human being. And uh, uh, there are, uh, this is, you know, one of the things that uh, Gila and I spoke about is to give you a little one minute primer on AI. So there are three types of AI, unsupervised and supervised. Clustering is a good example of uh, unsupervised. Uh, the supervised one starts from linear regression analysis, everybody knows, all the way to uh, convolutional neural networks uh, that can uh, be part of the deep learning algorithms. If you look at the slide to your left, you see this red line representing the state of affairs in the 90s, 80s, and even early 2000s. The computing power was not strong enough, so the other approaches were uh, much more superior to neural network. Today, what you see on the right is that this deep learning neural networks is exceeding by far the other approaches that have plateaued. So an example of clustering is to have pieces of data and the computer starts coming up with methods of grouping them into different groups and then identifying the error and moving forward. That's not good enough. Uh, the supervised learning has greater potential. Uh, it is, can be in uh, 3D uh, linear regression analysis, as you see on the right, uh, or it could be in the more advanced convolutional neural networks. Here, as training commences, the networks will start off without any fine tuning and return random results. And with every piece of information gets refined and refined, they're allocating a weight for every criterion they come up with and ignoring the unimportant features in order to make a diagnosis. So you can see these Ws that are associated different weights for every factor. Uh, they give you an output, and then as you add one more piece of information, the computer has to adjust all these Ws, the weightings, and by doing that, human mind can do it for a factor or two, but the computer can do it for multiple factors, and that's what's known as these hidden layers uh, within the deep learning neural networks. Uh, and again, if you think about applications of ophthalmology, the list is long. You can see retina is uh, slightly overrepresented for good reason. And uh, what I wanted to do here is to look at the literature, actually, and give you some examples at the end. And if we look at the literature, look at the biggest column at the right, that's only two and a half years of data, whereas all the columns before going five years is twice as much. This is experiencing rapid growth, and the green and blue colors are retina, diabetic retinopathy and macular degeneration. Dry eye, for example, has a great opportunity. You can see it's getting complex. The DUSE 2 study has shown multiple complicated ways. All these tests needed to make a diagnosis of dry eye. And I remember I was giving a talk at the Retina Society describing dry eye, and I asked, uh, uh, anybody uses this approach that I'm sharing here in front of you? Uh, all the diagnostic testing, you can imagine very few retinal doctors have done these tests. But that's how we diagnose dry eye. So I asked them, how do you diagnose dry eye? And uh, it was, they, they, it seems they have found an alternative to the DUSE 2 report. They asked the patient, do you have dry eye? <laughs> right, Gil? And uh, so I think we have a problem of either oversimplification of, or overcomplication. And that's where 
and artificial intelligence comes in, you could come up with algorithms that can become surrogate factors to make a diagnosis that's consistent with the rigorous model, but a little bit more accurate than a simple question. Uh, glaucoma has been uh, a flat curve for, for a long time, but I think it's, it's a little bit more difficult problem, as many of you can imagine. But again, this technology is going to help us go there. Fundus photography has been, the, that's where most of the work has been going on. Uh, refractive error prediction, the group at Google has done that. And they've become very, very close. Without actually knowing what the refraction of a patient looking at the retina, you can see all these little white lines on the fundus that the computer has arbitrarily assigned. And they can differentiate a myope from neutral from hyperope. They can tell how, what, how old the patient is, whether they have a greater risk for cardiovascular disease. And these attention maps differ for every condition that they're looking at. Uh, again, we can identify various retinal lesions that has been used now for FDA, uh, I mean, potentially approved or uh, submissions uh, for the problem of diabetic retinopathy. Uh, and uh, the key paper that I'd like to cite is the JAMA 2016 paper, uh, end of the year, that many of you are aware of, where uh, the Google group, uh, Google Brain, has shown that this uh, automated deep learning algorithm uh, did uh, as well, if not better, than retinal doctors when it looked at specificity and sensitivity. All this data is published, uh, but the greatest potential I think that we are seeing now is that you can go to multiple diseases. Everything I showed you was about, for this particular disease, can the computer do it? So the, the DeepMind group at Google has gone and uh, uh, solved the problem, I think, which uh, would have required millions of images to be able to sort multiple diseases by differentiating or decoupling between two problems, the technical variation between machine and machine and the pathological variation patient to patient. And then they use this algorithm, which is called segmentation. And with segmentation, they were able to identify a lot of retinal diseases that can assist the ophthalmologist. We're not talking now giving it to the uh, general practitioners, but this is in-house help. And this is a graph that I'd like to point to, that gray, the first graph to your left that shows 5.5, that's the model. Uh, the, this is the percent error. All these other columns you see are uh, retinal specialists in the first set and then optometrists, retinal optometrists in England. Those guys are experienced. Uh, the machine did as well as the best retinal doctor who used, in addition to the OCT, uh, fundus and notes to be able to make a diagnosis. That's very exciting. Uh, it clearly, there's great potential for using DeepMind's diagnostic tool. Uh, it's the future, I think, for making difficult diagnoses uh, and uh, uh, has great applications, but there are limitations. Uh, they include quality of the training sets, uh, diversity of the training sets, uh, problems with image quality, high quality, low quality, different lighting, uh, CNN-based systems likely to make errors, like human beings, artificial intelligence may make errors. And then there's this black box dilemma uh, that the regulatory agencies may have a problem with. So I'd like to end with a quote from Winston Churchill. Uh, clearly, AI, we're not at the end of AI, not even the beginning of AI, but it's perhaps the end of the beginning. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you.